Okay, so welcome to Coastal Corals Online Edition for October. And firstly, we'd like to start by acknowledgement of country. And um, I'm not really sure what country we're in at the moment because we're actually on Heron Island, but as we're scattered far and wide, I'm, um, I hope you all know your um, traditional owners. And if not, there are some great resources online where you can look that up. Tonight's online event is all about Rubble's stabilisation and dynamics with the lovely Tenya. So who is ReefCheck Australia? ReefCheck is a citizen science organisation that believes in protecting reefs and oceans by empowering ordinary people uh, to get out there and make a difference. Through the hands-on research and education, we believe we can better understand, appreciate and protect our marine resources for the future. So a little bit of housekeeping. So if we could please keep our um, um, microphones on mute um, and probably our videos off just to help with bandwidth. If you're not on the mailing list, um, you can email me at securveys at reefcheckaustralia.org and I can add you to the mailing list and that will let you know what we've been up to and what we've got coming up. If you've got any questions as you go, pop them in the chat box and we'll run those past tenure towards the end. Um, the group photo, we'll try and do that a little bit later because we might have a few late entries. So upcoming events. So for those people on the Sunshine Coast, there is a seaweed restoration day at Alexandra Headland on the 21st of October from 10 to 2. Uh, there is a little QR code there that can be scanned. Otherwise, you can jump on to the University of the Sunshine Coast website and register there. Then there's the Malulabar Foreshore Festival, and that's on Saturday the 4th of November. That's at Malulabar Esplanade. It has live music. We'll have a stall there. Some of our lovely ambassadors will be there. Come and have a chat, and we can let you know what we're up to. And if you want more info on that festival, you can head to sunshinecoast.qrd.gov.au forward slash MFR. Anybody around the Bundaberg area, we have the Elliot Heads Beach Cleanup that we're conducting on behalf of Tangaroa Blue. That's on Saturday the 7th of October from 9 to 11 and the meeting at this car park at the beach. And you can get more info by going to the What's on Bundaberg um, web page. If you would like to get involved, we have a couple of ways you can volunteer. If you're not a scuba diver, you can become one of our lovely ambassadors. These people are those ones who host our stalls at all of our events and help spread the word on the amazing work we do. If you are a qualified scuba diver and meet the requirements, you can undertake our surveyor training course and help us out with our reef health surveys. Full information on what's involved in both of these programs is available on our website. Uh, if you can follow us on all of the socials or sign up for our newsletters to get involved, find out what's coming up and what we've been up to. These talks are made possible by funding from a group of organisations, being the Sunshine Coast Council, Townsville City Council, City of Gold Coast, Port of Brisbane and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. And we'd like to thank the people behind the scenes who make everything happen. Um, the lovely Ilya's out doing field work at the moment, so she can't be with us at the moment. And tonight's speaker is Tenya, and she completed her PhD on rubble dynamics in the Maldives, which is like a totally awesome place to do it, before she started a postdoc at the University of Queensland within the Marine Spatial Ecology Lab. This postdoc was funded by the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program and Tenya is enthusiastic about conservation, advocacy and seeing wild places. She's actually one of our Reef Check ambassadors and a Reef Check surveyor, but she has been so busy with her PhD and postdoc, we have not seen her for a while, but we'll let her off. And, hmm, okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, it's all yours, Tanya. Thank you for that amazing intro. Um, all right. It is loading. Uh, 
can you see that? Yes, that's that's good. Cool. Um, yeah, so just starting as well with an acknowledgement of country, um, of the Turbul and Yugra people um, of Brisbane Mianjin, where I work. Um, and there's actually four groups um, that are the traditional owners of the Heron Island region or the more Bundaberg to Gladstone region. Um, there's the um, Tarabalung, Bunda, Gurung, Gurangurang and Bailey. Uh, and they're all administered, uh, there's a corporation called Gadajal. Um, and we actually just had a workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago with um, some of the elders and rangers from Gadajal, um, talking to them about their um, surveys that they do in the area. And I mentioned reef check to them about potentially doing reef check course and was going to follow that up with Jody and Julie. So, yeah, I just thought of that then. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about coral rubble binding and reef restoration more broadly today. And as Julie said, uh, some of my work has been in the Maldives. Um, most recently it's been uh, on the GBR, so in Heron and also um, the Keppels region, so all sort of southern GBR. Uh, if you're tuning into this, you probably don't need me to tell you that coral reefs are important and that they're uh, under threat from a number of disturbances. The disturbances that I'm focusing on today are anything that breaks up the coral and turns it into rubble. So you can have things like ship groundings, cyclones and cots, uh, dynamite fishing and bleaching as well. So this is a photo from the Maldives where I did my PhD. They had bleaching in 2016. And all of these disturbances basically breaking up the coral uh, into pieces. So you end up with these large beds of, of coral rubble pieces or skeletons essentially. And um, as you also probably know, we've had bleaching not just in the Maldives, but we had global events which hit uh, the GBR in 2016, 17 and 2020 and also um, most uh, recently in 2022. And that was a little bit scary because it was in a La Nina year. Um, these are just some uh, quotes from Terry Hughes just about the severity of, of those bleaching events um, and the amount of corals that were damaged in them. So in 2016, for example, 30% uh, of the corals were killed. Um, and so when those corals are killed with bleaching or another sort of disturbance like that, they are going to break down over time into those rubble beds. And yeah, they, there are predictions now that we're in an El Nino again that there will be bleaching next year, um, which is a little bit of a worry. So all of these disturbances can, um, yeah, break break up these, these coral colonies into rubble. So, and you can see that really changes the structure of the reef. So you go from this nice big branching coral with all the little hidey holes that fish like to hide in down to a very flat uniform um uniform habitat. So uh, that's all a bit depressing. What do we do about it? Well, um, we continue on with optimism in the face of adversity. And yeah, obviously we want to try and cut our, our global emissions, but we also want to try and help reefs at the same time adapt to the warming that is already locked in. And this is a quote from Reef Restoration Adaptation Program's website. So that's the program that I am part of. So it's been running um, for the last three or four years. Um, and it's a collaboration with a bunch of different organisations, including universities, as well as uh, our national science institutes. So Ames up in Townsville and CSIRO. And what that program is doing is looking at a whole bunch of different kind of interventions that can be employed to help the reef give it the best fighting chance to, to survive um, legacy warming into the future and really bolster the resilience of our reefs. So things like cooling and shading, which is using clouds essentially to shade areas of the reef to drop the temperature and prevent those bleaching events. Uh, heat developing heat tolerant corals through selective breeding and things like that. There's a lot of work in that space going on at Ames up in Townsville. And our 
a small part of it is rubble stabilization. So we're looking at the substrate that, uh, so we're looking at rubble beds, so after a disturbance, and looking at stabilizing that substrate to, um, to create a stable substrate for corals to, to grow. Why would we want to do that? Why do we need to stabilize rubble? Why can't we just leave it as rubble? and let it do its thing. Um, well, you can in some circumstances. Rubble is a natural part of the, of the reef. There's always going to be some amount of rubble on a reef. But um, as we get those increases in frequency and intensity of, of climate change-related events, like bleaching and cyclones and storms, we're going to see more and more rubble on the reef. And that can be a problem because although recruits do like to settle onto rubble. So there's lots of little crevices that they love to hide in, in the rubble habitat. Once they get to a certain size, you usually don't see um, see them anymore in rubble beds. So um, yeah, you get sort of this bottleneck effect in the rubble beds. And that can be due to a number of things, but probably chiefly the rubble movement. So the fact that now it's not stable anymore, it can roll around with the waves and the currents. And if you think of a little baby coral that is landed onto a bit of rubble and then and it flips over into the sand or it keeps flipping over, you're going to get that coral baby getting killed. So that's why rubble movement is important. If the rubble is stable for long enough, it can get bound together again into a stable substrate. And that's by organisms growing over it. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit more detail later on. And once the rubble is bound, then we hope that we get the corals that are able to settle on there. They're not going to get rolled around anymore and you get the coral growing and recovery of that reef in theory. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about these two things, rubble movement and rubble binding. And all of that is to answer this large overarching question that we're trying to answer in part of our rubble stabilization sub-program under RRAP, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. There's a lot of acronyms. So we want to answer what is the chance that a rubble bed is going to recover on its own? And to do that, we need to know something about the rubble movement and we need to know something about the chance of binding happening. So in terms of rubble movement, so the rubble size and shape is going to affect the chance of movement, um, but not a lot um, was really known about this before I started looking at it during my PhD. So the type of rubble that you get, whether it's large and branchy or very small and tiny, that's going to depend on the kind of disturbance. So you might get like a storm breaks it up into quite large pieces, for example, whereas something like dynamite fishing is going to really decimate it and create really small pieces. And also the amount of time that the rubble has been sitting around as well. And if we want to know how often the rubble is going to move, we need to know the speed of water that's going to move that rubble. So once we know that threshold flow speed, we know that when it hits that, the rubble is going to be moving. And then if it's lower than that, the rubble is not going to be moving as much. And so to get that threshold speed, so we want to know at what speed does the, rub the, does the water have to move to move that rubble around. To do that, I did a bunch of work in a wave flume at UQ. So laying out rubble and I had small, small bits, big bits, branched bits, not branched bits, and ran waves of different sizes to get different velocities and looked at whether that rubble was moving or not. And then also coupled that with some work. This is in the Maldives here. Uh, so this was after bleaching. So there was a lot of rubble beds there, which was great for my work, not great for the reef. And did the same thing, put out rubble of different shapes and sizes and looked at um, and measured the wave environment at the same time and looked at how much rubble movement uh, we got. And I'm going to show, oh, no, I'm not going to show a nice photo of, yeah, this is on the reef flat 
in the Maldives just to show that it's not all all rubble and um, it's not all dreary. <laughs> it was quite beautiful. And now I'm just going to show a boring graph. So this is basically the, the result of it. So you've got probability of transport on the y-axis. So that is, is the rubble moving or not? And then we have velocity on the x-axis. That's how fast is the water moving? So uh, as we would expect, as you increase the flow, the rubble's more likely to move. But what was most interesting was that uh, the small pieces were much more likely to move than larger pieces and also pieces that didn't have any branches. So they couldn't get interlocked or anything like that. They just were easily moved. They moved a lot more than uh, rubble pieces with branches that could interlock. Yeah, so the small ones move more. And this is just showing that at about... Um, 0.3 meters per second, we were getting 50% of the rubble pieces moving. So that's what I call the, the threshold of movement that we got. And so you can sort of extrapolate that to rubble beds of different kinds. So if you've got a, a dynamite blasted reef, for example, and there's lots of small rubble pieces, then we now know, okay, that's going to be much more vulnerable to movement and much less likely to recover on its own. Uh, because of the size and shape of those rubble pieces, they're more vulnerable to movement and even at velocities that are uh, seen very commonly on reefs of 0.3 metres per second. So that's the movement. And I'm just quickly throwing this in here. Uh, this is some work that a PhD student in my lab is working on, uh, Roima Peiwei Huggins. And She's looking into the fact that, okay, we do have this rubble movement problem that if rubble moves, that's generally bad for core recruits, but there's probably other things going on in the rubble bed that make it unsuitable for corals. And that also ties into the rubble size and shape. So we've got, yeah, these potential impacts, rubble movement, or maybe there's something else um, to do with the rubble bed. So it's a, it's a hostile environment for some reason. And what Roma did was looked at uh, coral sediment in rubble beds of different types. So she looked at rubble beds. So on the left, that um, rubble bed is made up of very small unbranched pieces. And then on the right, a rubble bed with very large branchy pieces that are quite interlocked. And what she did was she stabilized some of that rubble. So she took out the movement effect completely and still found that there was more recruits in that large rubble bed interlocked environment compared to the small rubble loose environment. So yeah, there's other things going on there other than the movement. Uh, okay, so I'm moving on to the rubble binding now. And you can think of I think I put this in here to show that the rubble binding is kind of like bricks and mortar. And so here we've got two rubble pieces and we've got a grey ascidian, which is spanning the distance between those two rubble pieces. And oh, just move to the next one. And this is a, another example of rubble binding, a bryozoan. So that, that white colonial bryozoan is bridged across those two bits. You can see the outline there. And that's the um, distance that it's bridged um, across the rubble piece. Other organisms include sponges. So this yellow sponge that has grown across, uh, that's another ascidian. And oh, yeah. And generally these things progress in an order. So same as in a forest where you have like a fire that goes through and then the first organisms um, and plants to arrive are, are those pioneer species. You sort of see the same thing. You can see the same thing with rubble binding after a disturbance. So it can sort of progress like this. So you have a rubble generating event, creates a loose, unbound rubble bed, which is potentially rolling around. If it's stable for long enough, you can get these pioneer binders that start to come in. So uh, things like turf algae, macroalgae, fast growing organisms, then intermediate binders like bryozoans, sponges, colonial ascidians. 
And then at that later stage, so these are things that take a lot longer to grow, including corals themselves, and uh, crustose coralline algae, which is a really important binder uh, out on the reef. If you've ever seen the pink cement that sort of covers everything on the reef, that is can be a really important binder to cement things together. So it can proceed in that order. But like a lot of things in science, we don't know a lot about it. So we want to know, I wanted to look into how long does that binding process take? Uh, who does the binding? So what organisms are doing the binding and where, in what different areas are certain organisms more important than others? And also how strong are the binds? So I'm not going to talk about the Maldives stuff tonight. I'm just going to talk about what we've been doing under the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. So for that, we've looked at, um, as I said before, two locations on the southern GBR. Uh, so Keppels, which is uh, Wapabara Sea Country, and Heron. So we've got our inshore location, which is um, uh, generally poorer water quality, uh, the Fitzroy had a flood event in 2011 and there's quite um, a, a number of rubble beds in that area, which were good for us again. And Heron, which is of course the offshore and better water quality location. And so in those two locations, we wanted to ask the question, so if the rubble is stable, uh, what sort of organisms are gonna grow on it and how long do they take to grow? and how strong are those binds? So we put out these uh, rubble grids, we called them. So they were rubble that had been um, bleached. So it was back to like a time zero in terms of succession, what you might get if you get a bleaching event and then rubble created. Um, and these were put at, uh, get something coming up. Ah, yeah, so this is what it looked like after four months. So just showing that we've got a little bit more growth there. So we deployed them and then we uh, took a subsample of these rubble um, pairs. They were put into pairs as our replicates at three to four months, six to eight months, 12 months and 18 months. And they were also put at different depths and, and different exposures because we expected the kinds of binding organisms that you're going to get are going to differ between different depths and exposures. So things that like light versus things that don't like light so much, things that like high exposure um, that are filter feeders that are going to thrive in that environment. Uh, another graph. Um, so this is number of binds per rubble pair over time. I won't spend too long on these plots, but you can see that the um, it's going up. <laughs> so the number of binds is increasing over time, which we would expect. Um, what is, and you can see that by about, so on the x-axis is time. So at about six months, we've got about two binds per rubble pair. And what was most interesting, and that's for both of them, at Keppel's is that you can see, so the orange in this one is uh, the exposed site. So that was ones on the windward site where it was much higher flow compared to uh, the blue, which is on the leeward side. So much lower flow there, um, generally more sheltered conditions. And so you can see the binding uh, on the exposed side at Keppel's was much higher. So much more binds by uh, 18 months, even by four months compared to the sheltered. So what we can say about that in terms of recovery is that if you have a rubble bed at an exposed site compared to a sheltered site, we would expect the potential for binding there is much higher than a sheltered site. Um, at Heron, go on. Uh, there was not as much difference. And I, I think that that is probably due to the fact that the that gradient of exposure was not as great um, at Heron compared to Keppel's. But yeah, I've got to dig into this data a little bit more. <clears throat> and this is coming back to the strength. So it's not only enough to say there's X number of binds. We also need to know something about the strength of the binds. So if um, it's all well and good to say that there's binding, but if it's very weak things like 
turf algae and things like that, then that could very easily be broken up in a, a high energy event, not even a, a big storm, just large waves. So we want to know how strong are the binds of those different organisms. And what we do to work that out is just pull them apart simply um, with a force gauge and we work we work um, out the, the velocity that would be required to pull those um, apart with some different calculations. And yeah, so that's just how we pull them apart. This is just showing some of our strongest binders. So our, our strongest pair ever was 98 newtons, which is like hanging a small baby off of one of the rubble pairs. So it's quite strong. And uh, that was due to nine binds. So uh, two corals. So you can see, oh, sorry, that's going to play again. Uh, yeah, two corals. This was at um, Keppel's where, yeah, after even after just 12 months, some of these corals had started binding, which was impressive because you've got the binding going on, but you've also got the coral recovery already. Um, so, yeah, corals strong, as we would expect, but also tunicates, which was unexpected because they're actually uh, soft-bodied and, um, yeah, I didn't didn't expect it. So the bottom picture shows, so the white is a, a colonial ascidian and then the red outline is, is a solitary ascidian, which um, I've called tunicates. And they were so strong that we nicknamed, nicknamed them Terry Tunies after Terry Crews, who I love. Um, and, yeah, they were really impressive. Other strong binders were vermeated snails, uh, sepulid worms, bivalves, CCA, which is that pink cement, or that crustose coralline algae that I was mentioning before. And sorry, I'm not putting the photos up. That's a sepulid worm. And then that's a bivalve on the right, crustose coralline algae at the top. And some colonial bryzoans, um, particularly this one in the um, middle at the bottom is uh, a spiky bryzoan, colonial bryzoan, um, and some sponges as well. And then this is showing, so now instead of number of binds on the y-axis, we've got the break force. So you can see that there's the same sort of pattern in that those exposed sites at Keppel's had not only the most binds, but the strongest binds as well. And that is because there was a lot of tunicates there, there was more corals there, there was more bivalves there. So all those things that really like that higher flow environment and less sediment, there was less algae there as well. And then at Heron, uh, some of the strongest binding sites, again, were those exposed um, shallow sites in particular. Um, attributed to corals, bivalves, and, and coralline algae, the pink cement. Uh, there was also a really strong binding in the uh, reef flat at Heron, which was very surprising, and I need to look at this more, but there was a lot of uh, vermetids and bivalves as well, which are, because they're calcifying, they're, um, they're, more, they're more strong. So I need to look at that a little bit more. So... What? What does it matter if there's two binds or 10 binds or who cares? Well, what we're going to do with this information is predict. So with the rubble mobilization information, we want to be able to predict how often rubble is moving based on these thresholds. So we now have this threshold of 0.3 meters per second. Then we want to apply that to with uh, fancy modeling to the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. and ask the question of, is the rubble going to move there? So if there's rubble there, is it going to be moved around easily? And then we look at the windows of stability between those movement events. So say we have a disturbance and then we have X months of stability before that rubble moves again. Then we have another so many months. Then we have another movement event where it reaches that point three and it moves it and then another, and then another. So we look at those windows of time between the movement events and we say, is that enough time for binding to happen? Um, and are we going to slowly get recovery of that rubble bed through the binding and then the coral uh, recruitment and recovery? 
And depending on the types of binders, so if we have a short period of stability, we might get some binding, but maybe it's only turf algae or macroalgae. And so when we get that when we get that movement event, that might break apart those binds. And so then you're back to square one. Or in a in a um perhaps more sheltered environment or somewhere where you're getting a longer period of stability between the movement events, then you might get colonization of those later stage binders like coralline algae. And so when you get another movement event, that's only going to sort of tossle it or not break those binds apart. And then you would hope that that recovery keeps increasing. And so all of that together, so looking at is the rubble moving? Is the rubble binding? All of that is going towards that question of what is the chance that that rubble bed is going to recover back to a healthy reef on its own? And then I'm just briefly going to touch on if it doesn't. So if, if we decide, okay, this rubble bed is very vulnerable to movement, the rubble is going to keep moving around. It's also not very good in terms of uh, the environment um, for, for binders. That's when you would go in and put some sort of rubble stabilization intervention. And so there's different sorts of ones that have been used. So on the left here, there's uh, these are rocks, uh, boulders that have been used at, in dynamite fished reefs in Indonesia. Uh, the top right, that's uh, netting, plastic netting, unfortunately, but and boulders that have been placed on a another dynamite fished reef in the Philippines. Uh, bottom in the middle, that's some stabilization structures that we actually put out last year out of sight at Bait Reef. So that was damaged by um, Cyclone Debbie in 2017, and it's a huge rubble bed um, in, in this area of Bait Reef. And then the bottom right um, is reef stars, which some of you might have heard of, so Mars reef stars. Uh, this is actually a site on Keppels where they place them and they their primary function isn't rubble stabilisation but it's been a nice um, side product, I guess, that they're looking into the effect of, of the stars on the actual rubble stabilisation. Um, but the primary function of them is to put them down and then to plant the corals on top. Um, so it's providing that substrate above the level of the rubble bed where that um, rolling actions going on. So yeah, that's some different kinds of rubble stabilization and that's what would be employed in the circumstance where you say this rubble bed really isn't going to recover on its own. And that's important. We need that because there's always limited money. So we need to be able to say what are the really problem areas and what are the ones that will probably recover on their own and they're going to be okay and they're going to bind okay on their own. Uh, this is just a fun video showing uh, us putting in the stabilization structures at Bait Reef. So we put them in in May last year and then we came back and monitored them in May this year and hopefully May next year. And yeah, we, we've got a couple of different types of structures. So um, some that are sort of pinning down the rubble and then others more like the reef star that are sort of just corralling the rubble together. And we wanted to have a look at those different um, sorts of approaches to rubble stabilization and see if there was any differences. And I think I have one. Oh, the fish want to play. One last slide. So I just uh, threw this in because I'm doing reef check talk and you survey the reefs. So I wanted to put in a, uh, a plug about the importance of surveying rubble. Um, basically it's important like anything to do with surveying to set a baseline so that we can detect change, but especially with rubble, because we are seeing, we are predicting that we're gonna get an increase in rubble on reefs in the future that we want to be able to say, okay, well, what's the, you know, the average amount of rubble on a reef at the moment um, and how is that expected to change um, into the future and what changes are we seeing? Um, a lot of current surveys uh, look at rubble but not uh, rubble bed types and 
So that work that I was showing about the rubble movement and the coral recruitment in those rubble, um, rubble beds of different types is showing that that is a really important thing that we could sort of add into uh, existing surveys to, to make it more informative around that. So rubble bed types are important, as I just said. So yeah, so small unbranched rubble, like a rubble bed on the left, that's going to be much more likely to move, obviously depending on the wave environment as well, but it's much more vulnerable to movement than the rubble bed on the right, which is large branchy pieces. And... And also not just the movement, but as Roma's work was showing before, that perhaps there's other things about that environment, whether it's flow, sediment or something like that, that's making those small unbranched rubble beds um, even more hostile. And, uh, yeah, so the more stable the rubble is, the more binding we expect. And that's what I was just mentioning, that that difference in the rubble bed type and have that having an effect on coral recruitment. and uh, surveying rubble can help us determine whether we need these rubble stabilization interventions or not. So that is all for me. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> If you have any questions or I'll just stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Jody's got a question. Yeah. I was going to say, did you want me to ask it? I, uh, yep. Just uh, <laughs> basically made a note of like, should we start then adding rubble bed type on our surveys? Because we document rubble already. But if we yeah. were to do so, then what do you classify as a small? We, obviously, we know what branching is. But do you have a size classification for small versus large? No. Um, <laughs> I so for this traditional owner workshop that I that we were involved with a few weeks ago, which I was mentioning, I came up with like a rapid sort of rubble bed assessment method thing, um, which could sit alone. But Chris saw it and was like, we should incorporate it in reef check somehow. Um, but I haven't really thought about it since then um but I think what would be good to sort of inform that is I've got surveys of rubble beds um where I've looked at like the stability of them and I think if I looked at the just sort of like the average size and how that related to the stability it would have like I'd have some data to sort of back up what I'm saying like generally I sort of look at less than 20 and bigger than 20 as like more problematic versus less problematic um but I think if it was to be incorporated properly I would I would feel more comfortable to have yeah just have a look at that data which I'm doing now I'm analyzing the binding surveys that we've done at Heron um just to sort of back that up um yeah but yeah and I also don't know if if you find rubble, like, do you give it? So what we do is sort of pull a few pieces, well, a lot of pieces, <laughs> and look at, like, do they move easily? So if it comes straight away from the substrate, we mark that as a zero, as not stable. And then if it gets, you know, hooked slightly interlocked or if it's just you can't move it at all, then it's a one, and that's our stability rating. Um, so that could potentially come into it as well as like if you see rubble, like pick up three pieces or something like that. Um, but obviously I know you you guys are already strapped for time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it would be cool to chat further and decide how it could potentially be incorporated. Yeah, I mean, I think if it was easy yeah. enough, like as you said, time is always one of the main components, but also yeah. any additional training that occurs to make sure that we're doing it right. So yeah. if it was, the reality is we're constantly updating like parts of the methodology. So if there's yeah. simple simple things that are a value add in which mm -hmm. it's actually being utilised by another group, then we're happy to do that. Um, but yeah. yeah, and it obviously needs some strict parameters mean what, around what that actually means. Yeah. And that but would yeah. Be in terms of 
like whenever you mark rubble, it would just be an addition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and if it was a number, I guess that's oh. the number would be. Yeah, I'd have to think about it because currently the database would not allow us. We could break it down yeah. into rubble one, rubble two, but the only person or the only people that might be interested in that is really groups like yourself. Um, whereas it, it, we would we wouldn't necessarily break that down to that level within our own data or any of our reporting. But if it was again a value add, and at the moment we're doing uh, photo transects as well, so that yeah. if we were taking photos of that, then you might be able to tell. Mm -hmm but yeah. you might not be able to. I mean, standard, they're all a meter off the, the benthos, but there might yeah. be a, a better way of doing it, that's all. So it will just be a little bit of how do you actually look at the data and collect it correctly and make it yeah. really easy essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And something that, yeah, like you say, doesn't need a lot of extra training or anything like that. Um, yeah, but, may, yeah, whether it was just an additional category maybe of like rubble less than this versus rubble more than this rather than just one rubble category, potentially. Yeah, and I mean, otherwise, if there was heaps of rubble, I guess, like at the moment, we've got dominant algae and all the other bits and pieces or like silt, whether that's there's a silt loading level mm -hmm. on the bottom of the data sheet. So potentially for the rubble, it could be in the additional comments is like rubble, uh, you know, mm -hmm. rather than it being in the actual substrate categories, it could be yeah. rubble. Zero, one or two or whatever the, the thing is and it means that yes you touch three yeah. pieces and pull them up oh yep cool so this is what it equals so maybe that's a we can yeah. take that offline but the reality is it's mm. I think that's probably an easier one as it becomes okay. a comment yeah. of like yep here's the extra stuff yes we picked it up three times unless of course you're at Heron and some of these sites are all rubble along it and then yeah. it's a little bit more time consuming but yeah. maybe it's just a matter of going this is what we found yeah something to talk yeah. about and work out anyway yeah yeah, cool. Nice. Anyone Thank you. else? Any other questions? No. Jenny? Yeah. Oh, that's true. In the chat. <laughs> no, Jenny has no questions. Um, all right. That's well, good. if everybody's good, so this will be going up um on YouTube in a couple of days anyway, so uh, people that will watch it will put up a notification about it. And, um, yeah, if you've got any questions um, that you think of later on, just send them through and we can pass them on to Tanya for you. Did you um, want to do a photo at all, Julie, or are you good? Uh, no, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>